blimp. But Matt's got his fancy <laughs> words that he likes to put on it. What words do you use, Matt? That Portuguese man of war meets a dirigible. <laughs> so tomato, tomato. So yeah, you can exactly. take what you want there, Evan. You can start with Portuguese man of, uh, man of war meets a derivative or yeah, that's blimp, blimp versus meet, meets jellyfish. It's up to you. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, sounds good. Jellyfish man. blimp. Jellyfish blimp sounds pretty good, but this we got a new kickoff song today. I'm going to sing Friday Night. Yep. Which is my original song. Wow. What's it about? It's about? It's about Friday Night. Duh. All right. Have some fun. Good question. What's happening? I was working all week. Nothing, Nothing exciting. exciting. I was waiting all week. <laughs> so boring. But tonight I'll go out because it's what? Friday night. Friday night. It takes up a lot of dance floor. I wanna keep moving. All, all night. night. I wanna dance. All, all night. night. All night. And I wanna drink. All, all night. night. Not for kids. Not and I wanna party. All night. And I wanna enjoy this night because it's what is it? Friday, Friday night. night. Yeah, that's, our, that's our genre today. That's kind of how we're kicking it off. What are your thoughts, Evan? <laughs> Is it better than our typical kickoff? Oh, what am I doing here? I don't know. Um, These I people think, got I let's think it's go. great. I think I think you nailed it. I think you got the tone perfect. Thank you. Look at this. People, let's go in the chat. We appreciate it. People going, hey, boys, in the chat. My wife and son are here. Right? That's pretty cool. Wow. Um, All right, sweet, hey, Mark. It's it is my son's six month birthday today, so happy birthday, Keith! Half birthday. Yep. Live I on YouTube. Six months. The answer is yes, Animal Gene. We are live on YouTube. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, and Facebook. Two different Facebook channels. Um, I'm Dylan. We got Matt, who is Argus's brother. We're going to talk about who Argus is more today and the origin novel, and we have. The all ever present um, Evan here. Evan, go Hi. ahead. <laughs> Hi. Man, that's my cue there. You Thank actually you. had it, but I kept talking. So, uh, what's up, everybody? Sam, good to see you, uh, especially on uh, YouTube. So, it's cool that we have multiple platforms. People are tuning in. Let us know where you're at. Let us know what path you're walking. And um, let us know if you have any cool ideas of other things we can like if for anyone that's been following us for a while um, and you're starting to see what we're building. I mean, one of the, the toughest parts of growing a, a following is just figuring out the strategy for marketing. So, you know what we're doing. You know what we're throwing out there. If you ever have any thoughts, give them to us. We'd love to learn. Uh, we'd love to incorporate some of them. Um, but yeah. That's that's what you're tuning into. This is a Facebook Live. Ask us anything. Ask us anything about the writing, the drawing process. Um, we actually just had someone join our Facebook group today or this week who she has a son who's like 14 and just loves drawing. And he wants to move from pencil drawing to digital art, not AI, digital art. Um, so I told her, I'm like, stop by, ask, ask questions to Evan about anything other than AI generated art. He'd love, <laughs> he'd love to answer for you. Um, I mean, you if, can ask me. You can ask me about AI generated art. I'll still we'll answer. Like answer. We'll, we'll, like, you're not gonna like it. We'll have a swear <laughs> counter for for Evan if you start asking about AI generated art. I mean, if you have questions, if you like thought of writing in the past and you have questions about plotting a fiction book, um, you have questions. I just saw the comment. You have questions about uh, writing. Um, a fiction story, writing a nonfiction story, feel free to ask us. Or if you like really just love Bastunia and you're here for Bastunia and you have questions about the lore, how did everything start? You know, what's going on here, here and here? Um, ask us questions we might not know the answer to. Um, we, we would be more than happy to answer. So that's what today is for. Like I said, my name's Dylan. Matt, how you doing, man? How, how are things down in Austin? Beautiful, sunny, not snowy. Not cold. That's perfect. Rub it in. We're getting flights canceled here because it's going to like snow and so much wind is happening in Michigan. Wild. Um, Evan, how are things out in San Francisco? I'm, I'm sure. Um, reasonably cold. It's in the, the 40s. 
nice. maybe maybe 30s at night, which is a little unusually cold for us, but um, it's nice. I like it. I like the cold. So coming from Florida, that's weird. Is that yeah, why but... you go to San Francisco? Uh, no, definitely not. But I, it, it is probably why I went to school in Chicago. Okay. Hey, we got a new fact. Come to the Midwest. Midwest. I did not know that. Well, we're getting wow. to know this it's, it's 2024. New year, new what? fact. <laughs> new, year, new Evan, new fact. And we're done with Evan facts for the rest of the year. First question actually goes to Evan. Um, I don't know if you see it pop up on the screen. Big question to start. Where do babies come from? Evan. That is probably not something our video is set up to discuss. I think I think Dylan um, probably sets these videos up with the intention of uh, being appropriate for younger audiences. Um, I like to tell my kids that we found them in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to figure out what I'll tell Keith. Uh, but yeah, my wife's so. listening right now, so I'm not going to say exactly what I'll tell Keith. Um, I, I, I tell my kids crazy stuff. I like to tell my well, my oldest anyway. She's the only one who can really uh, engage with it. I like to tell her that you know doves are are like bees. They operate as a hive mind. They have a hive somewhere. Doves, pigeons, street wow. birds, essentially. You really get into it, Sam. Sam in the chat said babies are created and procreate. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! I see what you did there. Oh, we got some. We got some funny followers. Funny typically means quick wit. Typically means intelligent. So ask some intelligent questions today. Um, Matt, do you want to tell uh, everybody what we're going to be creating today? Because typically we create a calling. Typically we create yep. a spiritual beast that represents somebody's totem in life of like, what am I called to do? That's not what we're creating today. Matt, what are we creating today, man? Yeah. So we're putting together an, an origin novel. It'll probably be an origin trilogy. It's about this guy uh, named Argus, who uh, you'll, you'll hear him mentioned in the comics later, but he's kind of the, the savior of the, the world. When, uh, when Bastunia is first settled, there is the intent that this is going to be a world like the, the world uh, where everybody had been populated from you know the old world people are brought from this old world to this new world and on this old world people really have a good sense a constant sense of what their purpose is in life so the the deity uh buntu would would bring these people to bastunia to recreate this old world and you have 99 people that know their purpose in life and he selected them very carefully but very soon, I think in the in the origin story, I was actually writing this yesterday, about eight years or so into their settling in Bastunia, they start to encounter uh, this galactic big bad. And these peaceful, loving, purposeful, uh, utopian people are suddenly starting to have some cracks in their perfection. They're starting to allow some judgment, allow some fear, and so they fracture into these different tribes. Argus is essentially this guy that will bring them back together over the course of a few books. Um, and so what we're seeing today is one example of those galactic big bads. They're, they're agents of chaos. They're called a Zigra. Uh, you'll also start to see them in the comics. If you look at book Correct me, keep me honest here, Dylan. I know that there's an Azigra on the cover of book two. Is there also a comic book? There's an Azigra. Uh, there also yeah, there's an Azigra on the cover of book both of one as well. Oh, yeah, both okay. of them. Evan would really know this as he he put the, the covers together. Cover number three coming in in the next week, I believe, right, Evan? Yeah. Fun fact if you're following us, make sure you check out what the cover is going to look like, like first draft of it. But what I'm hearing here is um, this this Azigra, Buntu, high deity, creates this world with perfect beings that then slowly become imperfect and there's a separation that occurs. Um, their perfection of being put on this world kind of shines this light to these chaos entities in the cosmos called Azigra. Um, and those Azigra start to attack uh bastunia and I, it starts to fracture the, these people even more um and what evan is drawing today is actually one that is referenced in this first book um giant azigra correct me if i'm wrong right matt it's it's big he's a big boy you know 
I, I assume so. The, uh, the, the context that we'll have as of yet uh, in, in this point. So in chapter five in the origin story, uh, Argus ends up in a place that he, he really should not be. Uh, I think, yeah, if that's a person, that's the scale we're going for. I feel like that's accurate. Nice, quick person drawing. Uh, great. Yeah, Paperclip that's... man. He's a, he's a staple in, in every concept art image you've ever seen. By Adam. Good. And so Argus ends up in a place that he shouldn't be. He snuck into what is called um, an originator. It's like these, these seven women that have kind of established this academic society. He's in, he's snooping around one of their, one of their, uh, houses and he finds a book and he's only heard of books it's like this um it might be a book it might be a scroll these are things that we're still kind of working through but um has never seen one doesn't know how to read unrolls it opens it up uh, sees a bunch of words doesn't know what they say continues to flip uh, doesn't know what this book is about sees the word a zigger on the cover but can't read it uh, and flips to this page where he reads. Let me see if I uh, can pull this up. He doesn't read. That? I believe the person he's with reads, right? I believe it's Avon. He's yeah, with a guy so. that's that's able to read this and, and talks about. I be, it's called a man of war. So this is yeah. Zigra being called a man of war. And I will give you guys three guesses of what we're going to stem it <laughs> off of from real <laughs> life. Yes, we're we're creative. We promise. Uh, so, so he what, says what you, that. Go ahead. In the in the excerpt, it says the picture was a creature, like something banished to the ocean depths. There was no scale, but the monster appeared immense. It billowed downward, dragging tens of tendril probes below it. For eyes, it had light sucking chasms, two gaping voids that drained into the sides of its head. A jagged spine bifurcated its skull and back. Its arms were man-shaped, bent at elbows, extending down elongated forearms into angular talons. So when Matt creates this, uh, he's thinking of the Portuguese man of war. And what's the D word you said you would also use? Portuguese man of war and a, and a dirigible. <laughs> dirigible. <laughs> and if you're Dylan, I would say it's kind of like a mix between a jellyfish and a blimp is how I would describe that. Uh, so yeah, a little blue ski sea creature, but we're blowing it up. So correct by Sam. And we're going to go and start answering some of these questions. And then I'm going to come back and ask Matt a few questions on this origin, um, on this origin novel. What's up, Facebook user? You got to do some weird thing on Facebook to connect your name to StreamYard. So I'm just going to call you Facebook user for right now. You can always put your name at the end of questions. Ian like Casey beautifully does. What's up, Ian? Ian? Cam. Cam. Ba oh, Cam. Cam Babcock. That's my neighbor. What's up, Cam? Uh, one question we have early on, is a bonita fish big? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's Step Brothers, right? Step Brothers <laughs> reference. Um, I understood. Now, we had another question from Casey. So we're going to take a quick step back um, and talk about callings, right? Because we we're talking about where do babies come from. But the question that he had is actually, when a baby is born, where do their callings come from? Right, so you got a baby coming from mother. Where does the calling come from? We're never going to show this in the comics or in the stories, but it is a question we've actually got before. I'm working with Rob uh, from Gold Mountain Games over in the UK, and it was one of the questions he actually asked me in like our first our first chat. He's like, "Where do you see these uh, callings coming from?" And the calling that you're born with is actually in the placenta that a mother would carry. Um, like she would give birth. So kind of the afterbirth that comes out once the baby is born, that afterbirth is your initial calling. For the longest time in, in um, Bastunia, people are born right with their calling. And right now we live in a time where people are only born with one calling that they receive at birth. So it really comes out like as part of the placenta, literally attached to um, the human as they come into the world. Uh, and you're always going to have a stronger connection with that first calling um that you have in your life now for those that where might does, go ahead i think this is where you're going to go with this question um where do you second yeah third nice way to interject right before i was going to answer <laughs> i do the same thing um that's also a question it's like okay but what if some of you might know that you know james has four callings most people can have up to three james 
two, one of James's calling is a twin. So it comes with two. Um, but regardless, you get these later in life. These are come down, these come down as a gift from the God in the representation of a piece of the God's hair that floats down um, and uh, uh, creates a calling as it lands where it's supposed to land. And if you're like, well, where did you come up with that? Uh, we actually, you know, stemmed from uh, Sun Wukong. Uh, Buntu, our great god of Bastunia, is based off of Sun Wukong, um, who is a great Chinese deity. He's from the book Monkey Way of the West. And he has all of these powers. He can transform into 72 different uh, creatures. And he has a monkey army that he just takes a tuft of his fur, flicks these hairs, and the hairs become his monkey soldiers. So we took a little bit of that and said, hey, why don't we just do the same thing with this great deity? Um, except that's how he bequeaths or gifts, not bequeaths, gifts, um, callings to other people uh, later in life in Bastunia. So, Casey, I hope that answers your question for you. Um, great. I love how these questions are coming in. Love the realness and the natural nature. Thank you very much. We try to keep That's actually something that... Uh, uh, Rob really liked as well from Gold Mountain Game. Shout out, Rob. Monkey King, amazing. One of my favorite books. It's such a weird book, and it was written so long ago. It's it's cool to know weird people existed so long ago. Uh, how, did, how did you discover Journey to the West, Dylan, if you don't mind me asking? Let's keep this going while these people watch and think of questions. There's another one I'm going to get to as well with the Azigra text. Um, I came into the way of the West, grew up super Catholic. Uh, so I grew up super guilty, feeling guilty all the time. I don't joke, but I kind of stepped away from it. I love spirituality. And when I went to college, I just started getting into spirituality a lot more, started getting in. I did a couple of yoga classes just to get credits while I went for a sport management major that I would do nothing with. Um, and then some of the electives that I like simple electives I could take. One of them was history of Chinese religion class. So I saw that and I'm like, I'm all about it. So took the class and the three books that we read during the semester were Tao Te Ching, uh, translated, obviously, uh, The Analects of Confucius, uh, and then Monkey, Journey to the West. And I was just so excited to be like, one of these books is a story. <laughs> I want to read that one first. So I actually read it twice. Love the Tao, love the Analects, Tao for Taoism and Analects of Confucian, Confucius. Some people believe in Confucianism as a religion. Um, but Monkey Journey to the West was awesome. And it was it was like a newer version. So it was a quicker read and read it. And then I started listening to a podcast um, on Monkey Way, uh, Journey to the West and just learned more about like a lot of their trials and tribulations with uh, Tripitaka, Sang Wukong. He calls him Piggy. But uh, I'm trying to think uh, of the the giant pig, uh, and then a couple others. So it was fun. That's how I came across it. Have you read it, Evan? Um, yeah, yeah. Where did you come yeah. across? I I studied um, a lot of um, East Asian <clears throat> East Asian literature and art history in college. Um, I spent a couple of years in in. <laughs> In Chicago, you're good. Good memory. There Second you go. Second fact. Um, I, I spent a couple of years in China. Um, so yeah, I don't know. A lot, a lot of crossover influence, I guess, is the Love short it. version Love of it. that answer. Actually, I want you before I answer this question. There's another question of how did you decide on what the Azigra would look like? You know, you have beasts already, but these are very different. Um. I'd actually love Evan to answer this because you and I were in communication and you started giving us some like sample. I said, hey, we want one of the beasts to look like a periton. Um, and then I just described the Azigra to you as like these shadowy figures from space. Uh, I said they're, like, they're almost like made out of shadows, very wispy in nature. What was your inspiration? Because you sent me like five quick draw ups. Um, yeah. That's that's right, and and um, I took a different approach than I usually do to the beasts on these live streams, which normally start with line and and um, you know I stay pretty close to like the comic book aesthetic that we have going elsewhere in the gee, elsewhere in the um, in this world with the beasts, but with the Azigra, it's a lot harder just by nature of the fact that they are so shadowy and wispy and 
um, as Dylan described to me at the time, like non corporeal. Um, and you know, how do you represent something non corporeal with line? It's a lot more difficult. It's a lot more challenging. Um, and it's not that I don't think that's a design problem that could be solved, but just for me to even approach them, um, it's a lot easier for me to go in and work with shape in this, this kind of way and just sort of carve back into it with light and shadow and try and try and discern form. Um, and then to sort of translate that into the like visual vernacular of the comics with line and everything it would require me to like go back and try and translate it. Um, so how did I decide on them? I, it, it's exactly that. I started with shape. Um, my, my biggest frame of reference where these are like shadow monsters, mm -hmm. um, or like eldritch alien creatures. And so this, th this one's feeling particularly eldritch now that I think about it. But, um, so what I would do is I would start and I would just start drawing in shapes in this way. Um, like you saw where I just laid down a big old bulbous shape that was going to, in this case, represent the jellyfish like head. Um, and I started carving into it. I carved into it with my eraser and I, I'm carving into it with a darker tone and I'm going to carve into it with a lighter tone and I'm just pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling until I come up with a shape and proportions and just a, a general size relationship, all that kind of stuff that I like and that I think reads well and um, feels right and hits the right visual notes, gives you the right read when you look at it. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the best answer that I have for I have for the ones that I've been presented to Dylan. I you know I went through a couple of iterations and I sent him a sheet. And he said, let's go with that one. And that's that's really what happened. That's how the, the Howler was born. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, you know, right, I name. interrupted somebody. You're good. It was, it was actually both of us because I was going to have a, a follow-up question, but Matt hasn't talked in a while. So let's go, Matt. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that has happened since uh, we've got these comics out is my my niece, Ashlyn, which we, we designed a calling for her, Alish. You can see that on our website on foundadventures.com if you wanted to look at Alish. Uh, and all the beasts, as a matter of fact. Uh, but she and her friend started to create their own comic. Uh, and this was like maybe eight, nine months ago that they she announced to me that they were going to do that. I caught up with her over Thanksgiving, and she said the project fell apart. And the reason that it fell apart is because she was the artist, and her friend was giving the instructions, and he had such oh. a rigid... Uh, request for her to create and she's 10 uh and so uh, skill aside it's not really a great way to go into a creative partnership with somebody saying i want you to take exactly what's in my brain so i'm curious for you guys um how how much freedom how much leeway as you said multiple times evan that you're a collaborator and we feel that way about you not the hired gun that's just like putting dylan's vision on 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 paper, so to speak. Yeah, how much freedom do you really feel like do you have to make this something that you feel like is your own? Um, quite a bit. I mean, you know, I always defer to Matt and Dylan that, you know, this is your IP, this is your vision. I'm not trying to... Um, and we said we yell at you. We're going to start yelling at you when you say that, right? Yeah. You do remember that. <laughs> I'm not trying to steamroll anybody. Um, but, you know, from the very beginning, it's been... Uh, it, you both have made it very clear that that kind of dialogue is very much welcome and invited. Um, you know, everything from maybe we should do it this way, or maybe here's something you haven't recons haven't considered, or, you know, I personally don't get this line of dialogue. You know, I know I'm coming at it visually, but um, I, I don't get it in the context of like the comic page. And so uh, a lot of times if I'm working on a comic page and there's a line that I feel like I know what Dylan was getting at in writing it, but it's not really reading well um, on the page visually, then I'll, I'll just go ahead and change it. <laughs> and then normally we'll have um, Dylan will do an edit pass and say like, why is this different? And I'll either have to defend that decision or I'll just defer to him and change it back. Um, but you know, I have that freedom to really exercise that, that those judgment calls, which you folks trust me to do in most cases. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that that's pretty invaluable for keeping the process going and keeping the lines of communication really open and um, all, all of that. So it's it's it makes for a very positive and very cooperative, collaborative experience. I'm just looking for a short answer here when I ask this, and then I'll answer Matt's question. Do you feel that's the case with most people you'll work with, Evan? No. Yeah. No. Because <laughs> I like. No. I would actually say uh, my uh, interpretation was what Ashlyn was going through is probably more than normal. And uh, to answer that question on my side, it's like, unless you're creating Akira, I think perfection is the enemy of joy. Like when they were creating Akira and like to the detail, what that guy wanted and like people would like quit and hated him and all that. But to, to turn out the masterpiece that they turned out, it's like, I can't think of much others that I don't know. Um, and we just uh, doing edits of the third book right now. And I remember literally the first page, my mind was like, does Artie really typically look like that? Or does Joan typically really look that animated? And I, I like, I try to be really aware of my body. And it's like, it's like, oh, this is my baby. And anytime I have this feeling, I can, I can feel my stomach tense up. And I try to breathe into it as much as possible. And then once I breathe into it, it's almost like that the thoughts can recede with it. I'm like, is it that important? And then I start being like, it's one of the compliments I gave you on the edits, Evan. I'm like, I want our comics to get more animated. Like, I want our expressions to get more. When we think of a manga, how crazy expressive some of the characters are when they see when they go through fear or when they're confused or when they feel dumb. It's like, I want that. And it's like, I want to lean into it. So then I started looking at it from that lens. And I'm like, this is actually a perfect way to show Artie. This is actually a great way to show Joan because we're showing more of Art Artie's goofiness and excitement to grow. We're showing more of Joan's like frustrated nature over like really small things that happen. I want to lean into it. And it's like, man, if I would have acted, if I would have reacted out of like impulse, I could have ruined that for like long term by saying Evan, like, Oh, this is the way that I want him to look. And then Evan never draws him that way again. So I think a lot of times it's just like slowing down. Um, I think the first time I, I chose, we chose Evan as our illustrator to be a collaborative IP, Evan, three of us, uh, like the first time I, I saw his work and I'm like, that's different than what I thought in my mind. I'm thinking Eastern. Oh, sound like my mother. <laughs> different well, in a good way. Different. What, what does your son do? <laughs> well, he's different. Um, <laughs> I remember I first saw it, it was just different than what I had in my mind, right? I'm thinking My Hero Academia. I'm thinking One Piece. I'm thinking uh, Demon Slayer, like the, the the manga that I read. And then I see this. I'm like, that's not typical. But I have such a, get ready, Matt, affinity towards it. Uh, Matt taught me that word. By the way, anyone else wondering earlier if they have a pin in it, I did not ever say the word corporeal to Evan, I promise you. Um, cause I had to look it up what it meant. Uh, but I had an affinity towards, I'm like, this is cool. Like it's different. And it reminds me of like the old American animation style. Let's go with it. And in that moment and getting further with Evan, I think it's like, he just kind of, he earned my respect to be like, yeah, I want him to, to show this. And we're actually, Evan, I'm doing edits right now for the third book. And I'm like, I can't really find much. It's like small things because that's me seeing you come out in the comic and yeah i, I mean I a lot you. a lot has definitely and changed you. in the way that i'm okay thanks um <laughs> in the way that i'm working on the book since, since book one um both in terms of my familiarity with the characters quite literally and enjoying them you know 500 times but um you know similarly in like my confidence to make these decisions and say like this is how it's how it's going to be how it's going to look um, you know, again, not trying to steamroll anybody, but just because I, it, it's more, more ownership over that part of the process, I guess. And in a way that's going to be really good because there are aspects of it that are going, going much faster and much yep. cleaner and there's much less back and forth. Um, but you know, at the same time, it has been its own form of learning curve with book three that, uh, we're getting through, but you know, I'm excited to see it done and, and 
get ready for book four. Do you feel it comes, and obviously you have a lot on your plate right now just as a human being, but do you feel like creating this, the more that you have grace on our side and the more that you're starting to understand these characters, does it feel like it comes quicker or does that perfectionist still come in to take the same amount of time? The perfectionist still comes in constantly. Uh, you know, as they get more animated, which I love to, to work with, it also means that I'm I'm like, you know, tweaking a detail that probably nobody will ever spot or care about, like the the curve of James's deltoid. Uh, you know, it needs to be just so in order to really nail that illusion of life. And it's like, yeah, OK, but does it really does it to make this work and to make this good and to get this out there for people to read and enjoy? Um, so, you know, it's a balance. It's a balance between how much do I really want to noodle this um, and how clear you know the goal is clarity so is it clear enough and or am i just going to noodle it to death and am i getting to the point of diminishing returns i guess is what i'm saying yeah i think with it too it's it is anybody that's wanting to co-create what i would recommend is going to sound a little woo woo but getting super clear on your why for the creative process like you could say, I want to create a comic, which is actually pretty broad. And it's like, well, I want to create a really, I want that because I want to create a really good story for young kids to easily understand. And if I were to get deeper, which is, I think this would be different than what Evan might say. It's like, oh, I want to teach really cool lessons through allegory and analogies. And I want that because I want kids to learn kind of in like that, that third degree of separation where it's not learning from me, but it's learning from a character. And it's like, that's what I care about. So for me to like remind myself that when something does happen and it's like this isn't what i envisioned my deep desire is not creating a um a colorful vibrant like picture masterpiece that's not me that's awesome to have it through evan's genius but my deep desire is the lessons is the stories is kids being like oh i learned this from joan and they don't even know i exist they just see my name at the bottom right hand corner of a page that would be sweet um, so I think reminding yourself that in a, in a co-creation process. Go ahead, Matt. And then I want to answer one of these questions about a Ziggurat that we, we yeah. skipped out on. Go ahead. We're similar in the desire to, to teach. Uh, and the first couple books that I that I ever wrote were nonfiction, a very, very heavy, very heady, uh, like sp spiritual lessons. And I, I think that's, that's fun to do. And it's definitely an exercise in like intellectualism but it feels way more pure to do it through story i mean there's there's moments in the story where this is exactly the lesson that we're trying to teach at this point in the story but a lot of times i think teaching through story is not making that interpretation of what we're trying to teach for the person it's like you throw the story out there and make it real make it relatable uh and Someone's going to take something from it. Another person's going to take something else. Third person's going to take something that you would never even expect. Um, and I feel like that's that's where we're going with this. Is just you know, it's, it can meet everyone exactly where they are and have something unique for them. I think that's a that's the fun part of writing. It's because I, I don't want to say I'll differ a little bit on that, but it's like in book two there's clearly a scene where James is explaining that you got to get outside your comfort zone and why it's so important to do that. That's me basically writing down to the reader. But in my mind, it's like that reader's not taking it from me. Like if yeah. they were to take it right there, they're saying, man, James is awesome. And that's cool. I wrote a nonfiction as well. Matt's background. It's one of the questions is how do we know each other? Matt and I worked together for a while at a company called selfpublishing.com because we were passionate about you know, books and writing books. It's always been fiction, but we both did nonfiction because it's easier to write. It's easier to produce. It's easier to put out there. Um, and I created people a nonfiction. Weird. What was that? People look at you less weird. Yeah. People look at you less weird. I don't know because sometimes it's like you get like when you put a nonfiction book out, it, for me, it's this feeling. That's why I don't like reading a lot of nonfiction. It's very like, Hey, listen to me. Um, hey, look at these words that I, I wrote for you. It just feels weird. It's like, I don't know, let me create. And of course, there'll be some things I want to teach, but it's less about me and more about the lesson, which I think is there's important. A, there's a big lie that we tell ourselves as nonfiction authors that when you when you write a nonfiction book that's intended to teach a self-help book, um, there's this illusion that, hey, we got all this stuff figured out. 
And in fact, it's all of the things that I struggle with that end up in the fiction book or the nonfiction book. And I will continue to struggle with probably for ever. Uh, and yet when you publish this book, like the subtitle of my first book is um, uh, Where the Rubber Meets the Road, How to, The Art of Giving Up the Things That Aren't Serving You. And then the second one is kind of lengthy. It's like the detours is uh, how to get out of your own way, find purpose in unexpected places, traverse the path to effortless authenticity. Kind of long. And it's posed as though like I am the expert in these in these things. And I'm so not. I'm just like very aware of how not to do it. And that it's a struggle that I have that other people probably have. But it does feel like I wrote the book on authenticity and it's just it's yeah. not the reality at all. It's like, I'm going through this, I'm writing about it and maybe it, it reaches you, which is tough. I think sometimes to fully sink in as a reader, it's like, Oh no, this guy knows his stuff. I'm going to read his. So to answer the one question I believe Casey had is how do you all know each other? That's how Matt and I know each other. Um, I did door to door sales when I was in college for five years. And then Matt did a different type of door to door sales later in maybe in college. And then, because he had that on his resume when he applied for selfpublishing.com where I was a hiring manager at the time, I had an affinity towards him at the precipice <laughs> of my life. Uh, so I hired him on. He just crushed it and we became close friends. And then how You're we met Evan for the SAT, man. <laughs> we, met, we met Evan in a Facebook group where I had a post that got a lot of hate from people because of my expectations for a uh, comic illustrator, which now living in it, I totally get where they were coming from. 10 books a year. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was put this post in a Facebook group and I'm, I wanted to get across the fact of, Hey, like we're looking for an illustrator. This is a big picture vision, right? Like, I don't want you to think that you're just doing like a one-off piece of work for us. It could be consistent revenue coming your way. Um, so I'm like, our goals is we'd love to do 10 a, a year. And I had so many people being like, how dare you put those expectations on us? Don't you know what people go through in the industry? They're breaking their backs for this. I can't believe it's so, it's so ignorant. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I did not know. I'm so sorry. But then a bunch of people like those comments that were yelling at me. And then it got more comments of people yelling at me. But how the algorithm works of Facebook is it then got more traction in the the wall, the Facebook wall that Evan just <laughs> literally Evan's comment was just his website said, Hey, if you, if you, <laughs> whatever, like he didn't care at all. He's like, here's my work. So I got to look through and I saw his work and I, I reached out and he, he, he said, yes. <laughs> um, thankfully, hopefully. Well, as, as tactless as your original estimate may have been, A, I, I heard that and I was like, yeah, we can do that, um, which obviously we, we can't. Um, we we're, can't we're, we're, we're realizing this. <laughs> but also, um, you are one of the few non-industry you know, non or non-agency represented clients or anything like that who was willing to pay for an art test, which I really, really appreciated and I think really is what kind of cinched for me, like, okay, yeah, I'll do this. Um, a lot of a lot of clients will say, like, I want to be sure that you can match our vision or expectation or our style or whatever. And so can you do this, this, and this? And if it works out, we'll we'll take it further. Um, and that's really just asking for free work. I was about to say that. So um, yeah, it's a big no no if you're trying to hire an artist, uh, which a lot of people don't know how to talk to artists. Um, but you guys, you, you were different. And so that, that went a long way with me. Yeah. Cause I was about to ask a question. How do you talk to artists? Cause I'd love to, uh, not like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, this is Ziggurat is coming is really cool. And it is, it's cool to see the differences in how you made this. Like you were saying earlier, it's like you're carving into a shape rather than kind of having an idea in mind. And it seems like creating it. Um, I'm going to answer a question that somebody has on the Ziggurat. Um, is it cool if I answer this mat or do you want to go for it? Yeah. Okay. Question, question, for you. question is how many Azigra attack in one go? Are they organized and have targets? Um, or are they just, they just kind of set to run wild. Like the short answer is the latter. Like they are set to run wild. They operate in a bit more of a chaotic fashion, but it's almost see them. I love how Matt describes it as like moths attracted to a flame. And that flame is like, someone that's heavily connected 
with their calling, someone that's shining their light and living their calling as much as possible. It's like they're living in communal with their God, right? No religion I'm trying to put across here. If you're watching this with your kid, but they're living in connection with something greater than themselves. That shines a great light. We know those people in life are like, wow, that person just walk in their path. Good for them. These Azigras see it and they're like, mm, first swear word, fuck that. Uh, we got to rip that apart. Um, so they're kind of attracted towards that. Now, there are also, we're going to learn as we continue to read, um, runes in the world of Bastunia that can call attention away from people. You know, they it, it can suppress other people. We're going to see that in the account of Argus, that these, these kids are carrying around a suppression rune to hide them from creatures like we're seeing right here. So there's things that the gods and the humans can do to combat it. But for the most part, these Azigra are chaotically attacking bright lights of people that are shining their light. Now, if we think of like levels of power or a hierarchy of a Zigra, at the grunt ground level, we have a Zigra. Things like this guy, things like the Howler that are going to creep into um, Bastunia. And they're the grunt soldiers. They're, they kind of attack. They can attack in hordes. They can attack singly at times. They, they, they range in size but they're the grunt soldiers of a, of a greater uh, army. They can be defeated by callings because callings are coded in aura, and they can also be defeated by auric weapons, which we're gonna, we see a glimpse of in book two. If anyone saw James as he throws that sword, uh, it's, it's coded in aura. They cannot be penetrated by a, a regular weapon that someone would use within Bastunia on a fellow Bastunian. Um, those are the Azigra chaotic and then above the azigra we have we, we still haven't figured out a word yet so we would love something in the comments we've used the word generals we've used the word elites um but they kind of are they kind of oversee these these grunt soldiers they're a little bit more strategic in nature not not super powerful but very strategic more powerful than a azigra but not crazy powerful and uh a beautiful example of that is his, his name is ah a h um, based off the god Apuk in I'm trying to remember the religion. Anyway, um, that's actually the eye that we see at the end of the the first book. Someone peering through. He's too, this elite is too big to come into the world of Bastunia, um, but he's able to orchestrate it. Um, he's able to orchestrate the Azigra that can kind of squeeze through and, and make it into um, the world of Bastunia. Because there's almost like this netting, this protective netting that's around the world. So we have a Ziggra, then we have elites, or a different word. Bastions, dig that, especially as a as a um, Overwatch fan. And then the final uh, tier, well, I shouldn't say the final tier, but the second to top tier are Titans. So we're going to have these massive Titans that are powerful. Some of them are smart. Some of them just brute force. But think of, you know, the Titans of Greek mythology um, that just rain hell wherever they go, tear full worlds down with them. It's actually the the reason these original 99 were put in Bastunia in the first place is their, um, their world was destroyed by a Titan. And then we have the big head honcho at a cosmic level who we cannot tell you. We will not tell you that. Um, but we get to figure that out when we get to the very end, hopefully, of this grand story. So hopefully that answers your questions of how many Azigra attack and win go. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's a bunch, but it is it is chaos. Great Anything question. I'm missing there, Matt? No, I think you did a good job. Cool. Um this is awesome. I don't I think we're you're just putting final touches on it right now, right? Evan? I'm, there... I'm just I'm just kind of I'm just sitting with it. I'm just I'm noodling. Uh, I'm digging into it. I think um, it's just noodles. ideally I'd probably like play with some of the proportions a bit, especially of the like the arms and tentacles and um, you know some uh, tweak the shaping a little bit. But you know, I, I think as an idea, it's um, it's fairly oh. decently laid in. I love um, it. It's Lovecraftian, in my opinion. I especially yeah, well, it. I mean, it's a it's a giant monster shadow jellyfish. It's it's the essence of Cthulhu. Yeah. And you don't get much more than this. It's just you know without the body. Um, yeah. I see that 
yeah. Matt, anything? I have one final question for Matt. And if there's any other questions y'all have about the creative process, about the lore, ask away. We like Matt and I come into these like, oh, we'll ask this, this, and this in case nobody asks <clears throat> questions. And then we're shocked that you guys ask enough questions for us to take the whole hour. Like that just means a lot. Like you clearly care about it. If you know but anybody in your life that would like this as much as you do, share the Facebook group with them. Like have them come in. We love meeting new people. We love answering like the early questions that people might have. So we really, really appreciate anybody tuning in. Um, yeah. What was I pass it over to Matt? You have a question for me. I had a question for you. Yes. Um, because we have a Kickstarter launching uh, January 30th that we're very excited and scared about because we have a big goal, 5,000 bucks um, that all goes back to the comics creation uh, and young kids speaking in classes. And in this, we're, we're selling book three. So you're going to get chapter three of the comic. Um, you can also have your own calling created if you want to donate that or someone that you might know. You could donate to somebody else or you can donate it to one of the kids that we speak to at local classes. So we go, I'm going to a local elementary school and hopefully a local hospital to work with young kids. And then if they want their beast created, our backers for our Kickstarters can donate. So you can, you can see those callings come to life as part of the rewards. But the other reward that you'll have is an origin novel written by Matt Emery himself, which we don't, we've, we've went into some of the plot in past book so we don't need to go into the details of the plot matt but i guess like yeah. if i'm casey or if i'm sam or if i'm rob watching this what what will the origin novel give them right like they're reading the comic what does the origin novel open up for them yeah you know as you asked that i what popped into my head is there's this you know the expression knowledge is is power i was thinking about this expression a lot um and what else knowledge really is. Because when you are, it's going to get unnecessarily philosophical, but. From you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you, I was walking at the park the other day, Dylan, you love when I story, story stories, <laughs> like I was walking somewhere. I was walking at the park and I see this, uh, and I was kind of wading through this creek and I see this orange snake. I don't know my snakes. Uh, and so I default to turning and running away from snakes. But if I knew what snake that was, and if it was just like a you know casual, friendly little guy, uh, then the knowledge could have been peace in that moment instead of instead of me turning and running. Uh, and if I knew exactly what kind of snake it was, and if I knew that it was friendly, then the knowledge could have been like friendship. Uh, knowledge is depth. You know, when I go to the, the same park and I see a certain bird and I see a certain snake perhaps or, or whatever thing, I, I can understand whether or not something is rare, whether or not something is special. I think the, the gift that is intended to be given by this origin novel is more depth. So that when you read the comics, uh, when you experience anything we put together, the, the tabletop role playing game, uh, or or other things in the future, you can just you can just understand the rarity. You can understand the specialness of of certain things that are happening. <laughs> I realized I was on mute. Um, no, and I do appreciate when you can elaborate on these things, man. Thank you for letting me also find humor in it. Um, but it is. It's like if you ever start reading something and you're like you're wondering like Easter, egg, you're wondering like what that means and certain things. You're like you're gonna get a lot of Easter eggs um, reading this origin novel. I'm editing it right now as like a um, content editor, right? Like what's the overall plot for the story we're trying to tell? Seeing if there's any plot holes. And it's one you've done an incredible job knowing your your stuff on our comic before making this. Like there's very minimal edits. And two, I'm like oh. That is an awesome kind of callback to what we're doing in the future. Um, and it, it, we also, it's like, this is why I would say it's our IP. It's like Evan asking questions leads Matt to elaborate more on this story. Evan asking the question, I think it was one time you're like, I was reading the first ch comic and you're telling me that we're only, this world's only 300 years old. Like how the heck does it evolve this fast? Like, don't you feel that's a little bit confusing? And, Instead of us getting upset and be like, how dare you? You don't know our creation. We're like, huh? Yeah, 
that's kind of right. What can we do? So what you're going to see in this book is why they, why it is said that this world is 300 years old and what came before that and why it restarted. Um, so you're going to be able to figure a lot of that out, which just, it, I think then makes it more fun to read the comics and you're stepping into an expansive world that's, or an expansive collaborative experience, I should say, that's got comics, it's got novels, it's got novellas, it's got literally going to my buddy's house tomorrow to think of a bunch of lessons that we want to teach toddlers and we're creating a children's book series that'll launch hopefully in May or June, another Kickstarter. Um, speaking of Kickstarter, last couple of questions. Casey, you rock, man. And happy belated birthday for anyone here. Mm -hmm. If you want to throw a happy birthday to Casey in the chat. Um, Casey asks, and that's <laughs> first thing he said is I bet I could beat him in an arm wrestling contest. This is the real one. <laughs> you could. Uh, <laughs> he's talking about the Azigua. Uh, will the comics be available as a package deal on the Kickstarter? The answer is yes, kind of. It's uh, the, the first two books will be add-ons. So you can add it on to your uh, tier. Uh, we want to keep it simple because sometimes when you go into, uh, <laughs> sometimes when you go into, hey, here's the first tier where you get just a book and an origin novel. Here's the next tier where you can get, you know, book three and book two and the origin novel. Here's the next tier. It's like, it can get confusing, but we added book one digital and print, book two digital and print. Um, oh. Matt, if you want to write this down too, thank you, Sam. Means giant in. He didn't tell us what language, but the Hafori's in yeah, China. Really cool. Yeah, I think it's a cool one to write down as like what ah would be because general just seems so simple or elite just seems like it's overused. Um, we actually take a lot of our uh, words from different places that Matt or myself have traveled. Um, Maji actually means wa Maji, which is James's beast means water in Swahili. And I lived in Kenya for about three years. So I actually take a lot of Swahili words. Pendemoto. Pendemoto. A couple other things. Burning uh, love is what Pendemoto would translate to in Swahili. Moriwazi is another one that comes up in the in the origin novel. It means open heart. Um, naku. Uh, naku penda means I love you. So Naku is kind of a, 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 a section of that. This is another one of James's beasts. Zimbabwe is a country in Africa. Thank you, Sam. Zimbabwe, maybe we call it that. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Casey. You can get those other books as an add-on. Ubuntu is actually, um, Ubuntu means um, seeing the light of oneself in another. It's like instead of just saying the word empathy in Swahili. Swahili is sweet language. Like Swahili's word for sorry is pole. But instead of it just translating to sorry, it actually translates to I empathize with you. So if someone like trips and fall, like knocks all their stuff in their hand down and you say pole, you're not just being like, oh, sorry. It's like, damn, dude, I've been there, um, which I think is kind of cool. What was that word that I'm supposed to be writing down? Um, oh, that. Hafori. <laughs> H-O-F-O-R-I. Cool thing about African uh, languages too is it's it's very uh, it's they're much easier to pronounce. Like it's just say it what you think it sounds like. They're phonetic. Phonetic is the word. word. Phonetic is the word. Um, yeah, it's like that. The, I'm hopefully starting a, my D and D campaign again. Lyrian Lolithi from a Drow Druid um, is my character. That's really it. I think we're kind of getting towards the end um, today. Evan has Evan has poked and prodded and carved as much as he can into this. It's it's so weird because it does look so much. It's like a different style from like a. Mm -hmm. And I think it's cool because it's it, it's showing the differences of order and chaos. Right, order that's going to come from a calling and chaos that's going to come from a um, a ziggurat, or as Matt calls them, hell spawns. Chaos spawns, but right? well, this could be the the image on this page too in, in chapter five, which I'm excited to have some illustrations infused within the story. Yeah, I think it'd be really cool to get because making it more not graphic novel total, but it's like every you know twenty pages they get a picture just to like because I think sometimes it just kind of helps us. I'm not super visual, so it helps us uh, with that. Evan, anything you want to leave us with? Any any just you know. 
philosophical thoughts and motivational inquiries that you've been percolating on? Keep drawing. Is anyone out there? Just keep drawing. Uh, keep drawing. This is a other really good question. Once we get big enough, man, like I know Matt and I always talk about this. I know this is going to get big. I know this is going to be something awesome. Once we can turn this into a business and we're not taking everything from Kickstarter and putting it right back into the book, you know, I'd love to, Matt and I know enough of the business building techniques from companies that we work with to turn a business out of it. And that would be a very fun camping retreat. And I am not going to say anything else on that. Um, yeah, better not. <laughs> well, any of those saying, um, now that you can see Evan's drawing on the screen. I will read. The picture was a creature like something banished to the ocean's depths. There was no scale, but the monster appeared immense. It billowed downward, dragging tens of tendril probes below it. For eyes, it had light sucking chasms, two gaping voids that drained into the sides of its head, a jagged spine. Oh, dude, why are you doing this to me? Tintibulation. Tintibulating its skull <laughs> and back. <laughs> its arms were man-shaped, bent at elbows, extending down elongated forearms into angular talons. Nailed it. Other than the tintibulated. Uh, we're super excited that you all came here. We appreciate that y'all are taking time for... Uh, <laughs> we appreciate y'all are taking time for creativity and imagination and finishing your week with us when you don't have to. So... We will see you in two weeks. Bring a beer or an apple juice or a soda and just ask fun questions. I think this is kind of a fun hangout with uh, our following as it continues to grow. And we appreciate you guys so much. It, it's hard to do what we do with, without some uh, validation that it's, it's landing. So we really, really, really appreciate it. And we will see you all in two weeks. Matt, anything you want to say? That's a really good sign off. But anything you want to add? Awesome. Evan? Mm -hmm.